So uh, can you tell us uh, the premise for the show? So uh, restraint and limitation um, was an idea that I came up with a few years ago, and I actually showed variations on this work in two other locations over the years. Um, and some artists have come and go, come and gone. Some artists are have been in every single one. Some have shown some different work in each one. But ultimately the premise was to say we're going to take three artists in three sort of different stages of their careers and then build uh, a body of work around them that um, enhances and challenges and pushes around on that work. In this instance, it's Magalie Guarin, Sharon Butler, and Anna Buckner, who are our sort of three core artists. And then we've built a group of about 10 others around them. The big premise for me, and, and the thing that really got me going in terms of what I wanted to talk about in this show as a, as a curator, but also as an artist, is the notion that abstraction and the potential that abstraction has is not limited to being this kind of like a step, step child of painting to representation or entirely related to representation uh, in terms of depiction, but rather potentially, maybe, being a little bit closer to the idea of perception. So both representational depictions and abstractions rely on, in my mind, a sense of our own perception, how we observe, how we see, what causes us to pay attention, and what causes us to move our eye. And then uh, part and parcel of that for this is the idea that it doesn't have to be huge. There are very, very, very small works in this show, and then there are relatively minorly sized large works. But everything is really under that, roughly underneath that like 20 by 20 inch range, everything is below that. And so I think that in the history of say 20th century abstraction, the idea of it being big was super important. And that was like part of the content. Um, here I think there's something else to be said for using a little bit of restraint, limiting yourself, um, and finding the crux of what you're interested in or what you want to pay attention to through that limitation. So, particularly with somebody like Magalie Warren, one of the reasons why I chose these two pieces is because what she's doing there is really dynamically constraining herself to a particular format. And then she's challenging us as viewers by inverting one, asking us to compare and contrast and relate constantly. We're thinking about what is this shape doing here versus there? How do things pinch, roll, and turn? To me, this is a very perceptually aware piece, which I think makes sense in the context of what Maggie Warren has done in the past. I think of the hats, the series of hat paintings that she did. Could, could you, so keep in mind the audience that you have for exhibitions can mm -hmm. range from um, people who are very engaged in the arts mm -hmm. um, and a part of what can call the art world. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then we also have people who are um, in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, like the mom who came by when you were installing, mm -hmm. wanted to just bring her kids in, right? Mm -hmm. So let's define some terms. Okay. So when you talk about, I'll give you some few questions. When you talk about perception, what do you mean? When you talk about abstraction versus depiction, can you talk about what you mean? Um, well, when I talk about perception, what I mean is the, the, the idea that the mechanics of our eye um, have some kind of agency in them. What I mean in that is that when we look at something, we're automatically making associations. There's automatically an abstraction that's happening just by virtue of how we think with our visual cortex and how that's been influenced by all the things that we've experienced, how we've seen, what we've done, um, where we've seen those things, that's built up that sort of a database of visual metaphors and suggestions and connections. So when I see a shape like this, as an artist who's trained, I might think of Charles Schiller. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm looking at these, the sequence of dots, I may, as a trained artist who spent nine years into, I may start thinking about George O'Keefe's large piece with the clouds. That is a specific kind of perceptual grasp about references, but there's also a part of perception that's about 
how I see when I look through the door back there and I see myself in superimposed over those green branches. There's the idea of membrane, the idea of what is passing through becomes super important. And so I think that there's something about perception and how I see where things are and what I understand of their color and what I understand of their shape being extremely subjective and received, but also constructed in the moment. So that's perception as point of view. Right. You know, um, yeah. I perceive the situation as such. Mm -hmm. right? um, and then you talk about perception in terms of seeing, the mechanics of seeing with the right. eye. Um, but then with um, Magali's paintings, there are other things that are to be perceived when we're actually looking at the paintings, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's a very tactile, dimensional surface. Mm -hmm. There's a, a kind of touch mm -hmm. that's operating. Um, and, uh, and then we also can, when we see them, um, we're invited to wonder how she made them. Mm -hmm. um, because you can see that they're made in layers, and you can tell that certain choices were made first, right. and that other choices come afterward. And then there's this strange thing, which is that um, although I remember you saying these pieces weren't necessarily meant to be seen together, mm -hmm. but if you rotate this piece, it's the same as this, but not quite. Right. It's both hand done and right. the, the irregularities, and um, and. It, it looks like, a, it doesn't look like something that she meticulously planned, but how could she have made them the same? Right. So there are those questions. You automatically start to think about order of operations, right? Just based on how the surface looks, you start to think about, hey, this had to come first because this is here. Mm -hmm. But then, if this was painted first, then was this painted at the same moment? So was this shape made and then this shape was made? Like, how is that working? But then there's also order of operations of the visual information. You know, like how this dark mass comes forward here and that appears to be sort of light, maybe a, a distended field or something passing back. So then there's this sense of landscape information, space information, surface information, and texture. And that also implies order of operation, like mm -hmm. the direction that something is going in, right? When you talk about landscape, so you could be using the term landscape metaphorically, like somehow the landscape of the painting, but I'm guessing you're also talking about that uh, pictorially, that yeah. there's an aspect of these that it feels could, like landscape. Right, it could potentially be a suggestion of a, of a landscape proceeding back, you know, I mean, almost like a, like a going to you of a way. Or area, yeah. right, you're flying mm -hmm. above it. But, um, this also takes us to this notion of abstraction, um, mm -hmm. uh, because you know when uh, you think about you know, if we're in, you know, it's called layperson or non-artist land, mm -hmm. and you think about abstraction, and you think about the realm of ideas. Um, mm -hmm. but there's also a tendency when you think about abstract painting to think an abstract painting is a painting uh, uh, that doesn't have a subject you can recognize, right? Um, or that it came from a specific reference. That reference has been sufficiently changed to define my ability to name it. Right. Which, and, and that's sort of like abstraction 101. Right. But what I think a lot of these artists are doing to one degree or another is actually playing with the, the, the interplay between what is represent, representative of the artist's action and what is representative of the visual information that the person can receive. So they function simultaneously as an event, but also as, like we were talking about, this thing that we can read in the passageways and how we push through. And that's the reason why a lot in the history of painting, a lot of the greatest painters were ones who could give us both the event of the abstraction of what we're seeing. I'm thinking of somebody like Rubens or Tiepolo or, or uh, Rivera or something, right? And then they also give us that passageway, which is about the surface and the action of the paint, but then we give it that representational information too. I, I think that for me, I want to see abstraction that is not subservient to any reference, but not being non-objective. Yeah. That's the tension that I want to have. Yeah. So this would be a moment where, um, uh, and I'm guessing, I know Liz can do a little editing, but this might be a moment where it would be very cool to have a 
end really close and moving across the surface of the paintings. One of the things that, that happens with these when you get close to them is that they're a whole different event when you're up close. When you're far away, um, there's a, a kind of uh, image which you see figure ground tension mm -hmm. and rhythm and movement and there's some illusion that operates and there's a kind of visual weight to the choices that are made and there's also a kind of rhythmic connection which Magali may or may not want because I don't know, she needs these to be next to each other. Right. We certainly see these like this kind of swoop and this kind of connection. But when you're up close, you're completely engaged in like this little gully, right? Mm -hmm. And this edge and this kind of slip. Mm -hmm. and, and the way this that looks like it could be a piece of string yeah. <laughs> seems to exist underneath the skin of the paint, right? right. And then this mark, which feels like it's pushed through the paint. And all of those things, that kind of touch and uh, that sense of um, the way the material touches the surface and the way our eyes connect with that tactile experience of the surface of the paint. Lot, I, like, I like that you're bringing up this idea of touch because I think touch is really important with Anna Buckner's work, yeah. which is one of the other ones. The, the sense of touch is very, very palpable in a number of different ways. There's, it's not only like the texture of these different materials, right? How sheer this is and how, how silky it might appear to be to our eye, that haptic sense, mm -hmm. but also the fuzziness of that or the, right. the feltedness of this. This piece is almost quilted, or maybe it is quilted. Yeah, these are considered her quilted paintings, is kind of how she thought of them and how she talks about them. Yeah. And, and the tension, literal tension on the surface of how the, the fishing line here, this monofilament line, has been pulled taut, the, the surface being um, a, a literal zone of engagement. Mm -hmm. You can right. see it going over the edge. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm looking going, how did she do that? <laughs> and, you know, this work has been in all three of the iterations of this show, and it has not reduced in tension at all. It hasn't sagged. I mean, she did a really good job, however she did it, to get this right, perfect balance. And I like also in the other two pieces where she's pulling, and the different materials have different amounts of give mm -hmm. and different amounts of stretch. Mm -hmm. And so there is... Not, I mean, and then she uses the grid and she's distorting the grid and there's a sense of maybe uh, the suggestion of how that grid functions uh, back to the history of painting, which is mm -hmm. so much of the history of painting is about referencing to the edge or referencing to the boundary. And by the edge, you're talking about this right? Yeah, right. yeah. Right. And so one of the things that happens in these, and it also happened in Magali's piece, is that this this sensation of of the the painting as a physical thing, mm -hmm. and so this awareness of the surface of the painting being a material, it's also stretched mm -hmm. around a form, mm -hmm. and so this thing has a dimension, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have this you use the word tension, so mm -hmm. we call it a tension between the surface and this awareness of the material and the stretch of the material, but also an awareness that we're still looking into that surface. Right. And so even though it's an abstraction that we can't necessarily name the mm -hmm. thing that's in it, we still have this world. Right. And we still start to have illusion, even though we're super aware of the surface. So with this, this does this kind of weird fold. It's like a, um, and this seems to do a, a fold this way, mm -hmm. like an interior domestic space. Right. right? Well, what's funny too is that this one is called Dutch Still Life. Okay. So that automatically there's this huge reference that comes into that. And the, the, one of the things that I really love about these is how they have this sort of uh, humility and uh, audacity at the same time. Very much like, like an interior, like an old Dutch Still Life where there's really small, you know, those tiny Dutch interiors that you often see. Um, and yet there's a kind of engagement to your eye because you know what it would feel like to touch that, mm -hmm. you know, to touch that surface. Well, this, it also plays with this thing that a lot of those still lifes do, which is they'll, they'll take something, it's a little moment of illusionistic finesse, like they'll have the lemon mm -hmm. peel, yep. which will come off the edge of the table yeah. and poke through the picture plane. Right. So it starts to go into our space. And so here we have like the fringe, which is right into our space. Right. And so we tend to, because we see so many things today in reproduction, mm -hmm. right, 
we tend to just see these in terms of images. Like on our website, when you see this reproduced, it looks like a great big painting. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's a little intimate thing um, that's very physical. You know, we're really aware of what it's made of. That's the other thing, like you mentioning that is exactly one of the things that I've heard for years about this work is that it seems to be massive when you look at a reproduction mm -hmm. on Instagram or on the web somewhere, but when you come up to it in space, I actually think its implication is still large. I think a lot of these words could probably hold the whole wall on their own, or we'll even hold a room on their own, mm -hmm. some of them. So it's that sense of it having that palpability, that physicality, that tension, but then also being something that um, is strangely scaleless when you don't have a scale mm -hmm. uh, context. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I think this work does function with Buck um, Buckner's work functions with Butler's because Butler's have, they're not physical, and yet in this this sense they become physical because we've made transparencies of them to present them. These works are part of an ongoing series that um, Sharon Butler has been doing. They're just drawings that she makes on her iPad or on her phone every, every day. And she posted them for many years. Um, and they have some of the classic kind of like hard edge abstraction things of penente and, 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 the, and the implication of things being layered, can you, can transparency. Can you find, for those who don't know, penente is? Penente is that sort of the elements that are left behind or are underneath and show through. Um, so you may have a, a situation like this where there's an edge that's a line that's been broken by a new edge, or you have a, a form that comes over the top and it implies that there's something underneath it. Here, where it seems as if a specific kind of form has been clone stamped and pushed around, um, maybe using a little bit of uh, different types of brushes that are available. Um, You're super. It's a little super lock on the whole thing here. You're, you're like you're very aware. You're very aware of these as being made on an iPad. Yeah. Me, I do not work on an iPad, mm -hmm. and so I look at these and the ref, the visual references I make are to abstract paintings. Yes. Pages used. Yeah. So I'm looking at these and uh, and I'm reminded of certain. Of artists, I'm also reminded of Sharon Butler's paintings mm -hmm. with actual paint, yes. right? Um, and so, so many moves in this look like painting moves, even like in a regular yeah. edge like this look, could be. A I, I feel that that's what they are—that they're essentially studies for moves that she might make on a larger scale in her larger mm -hmm. paintings. Um, but I also think. You know, like you were talking about, like you don't see them as you, you didn't, you don't automatically think of them as being digital, whereas I automatically think about them as being coming from the digital. And I think that one of those things that's in my mind all the time is the sense of something being natively digital, in other words, made digitally, versus something being natively analog, and how so much of work that's being done today is going back and forth and in and out. I mean, in some sense, this. Having these be printed out as transparency, I mean, essentially they're prints of, they're, they're physical prints of a digital image that doesn't exist anywhere except mm -hmm. in her computer or on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And so there's a tension there that actually pushes back against the physicality that we were talking about with Wherein and Buckner. There's an interesting play there that I think is happening. Well, you were talking about size mm -hmm. versus scale. Mm -hmm. And you talked about um, Buckner's work as being scaleless. Mm -hmm. I would, I'm not sure about them being scaleless. What I, what I would say is that Buckner's work does this strange thing, uh, and I'm not as familiar with her work as I am, as I am actually with, um, with um, Magdalene's work and also with, with this, with, with uh, I, I know, uh, I've seen Sharon's paintings, I've seen a lot of Magdalene's work, I have not seen any of Buckner's work, but um, uh, Anna Buckner's paintings, um, seen in reproduction to have a large size. And so their image seems large scale. Yeah. Right? They're physically small. Strangely, when I see them in the flesh, mm -hmm. um, they seem to be uh, life size, like one to one. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they actually don't seem like, like the image doesn't seem larger than the size, or you know, right. it's, they're, it's very, they're very different in person. These, on the other hand, um, in, in reproduction, if I were seeing them on my laptop, I might imagine them, I could see myself imagining that they were large, mm -hmm. 
Um, it's strange and it's interesting to me to see them like this because they seem to, to my mind, exist as prints and they actually exist as, as having a size mm -hmm. and having an intimacy, mm -hmm. which things that are um, digital and exist only in digital form mm -hmm. don't. They actually never have an actual size mm -hmm. except for the size of the computer screen, right? Or the projection mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Um, and so the scale that we experience is all in our minds, right? But these now physically exist, and they actually seem to be the right size, mm -hmm. you know, even though you know, the size that they were made at, or, or the, you know, that she had in mind, I, I don't know what that is. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, they seem to be uh, about their own potential, you know, like they're an idea of potential for a work. Um, and they are the work, right? Um, I don't know, I think that there's something really interesting when you look at a work and it feels like it, it is what it is, it's fully contained versus a work that suggests other things, right? One of the reasons why we put this, at least for Golo, right next to the, the butler is because of the shape on this, it's sort of a wiggly, this is called a wiggle room. And it, this is an acoustic, so we're talking about yeah. completely different types of physicality going on, but a similar visual dynamic and a similar kind of, almost like a visual reference to movement. Yeah. Um, so we've got this, right. and then you can see that in, in here, mm -hmm. the kind of rhythms that happen through. And that's one of the things I try to do throughout the show. You know, we've got this, but then if you see the relationship between these Michael Hopkins paintings, very, very gentle washes, just little washes of gouache, so thin, so ephemeral, just gray on black. You compare that to the Sarah Arigata paintings that are so dense, so modeled and worked, mm -hmm. and how a gesture versus multiple gestures over many days. So. Try to move across the surface and also get these at a at a real angle. Um, I can see them right against the wall here. I'll get out of the way. And um, and then maybe you can also do this to you know, mispronounce Rugal. Rugal's piece, right? Um, and and uh, the differences of that texture. Right. And yeah. I think you can do it to these pieces too. All of them really. I have no idea what the phone can pick up, but all of these have all these nuances of surface and the image changes as well when you see it mm -hmm. from different angles. The Regolo as well because it's this waxy surface, this encaustic. Um, and, it's, and it's always interesting to me too how artists will, in, in how they present the work to us, will suggest you know, something that's a little bit more representation or something that's less representation. Yeah. This is called Wiggle Room. And these two, Sarah has titled them the names of people, Flavia and Olga. So the idea that they have personality to her in this very specific and distinct way. Over here, um, Michael has titled this room Belly because it's got this kind of shape of a little you know, belly button and a little kind of the pouch, right? That heap of wheat down there. There's like a sense of that feeling that a person is thinking of the work, even though it is totally abstract in a certain way. It is, it is in some sense not referential, and yet they give us a reference. What you also have, though, is there's a, a relationship between nuance. Mm -hmm. I can, I'm so close, I'm blocking the camera. There's a relationship between nuance mm -hmm. that is really, really, really subtle relationships, mm -hmm. and then the physical surface of the pieces. Yeah. The which is which is not nuanced. It's like either you're the object or you're not. Right. Right? That's right. like boom, it's physically there. Right. And they all, you know, these three pieces though, I'm just particularly aware of it, um, they they have a certain kind of um, weight to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, this um, this uh, fleshiness mm -hmm. to them. Where they uh, they exist like like they um, have a they're kind of alive mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because of this back and forth that happens as you as these subtle variations come in and out of focus yeah. and and the piece shifts 
you know, as she, she says, move around it. And it really is. She you says, know, stare at it. It's, you know, like how you mentioned in the past a little bit, you know, the idea of that touch sense or that haptic sense, mm -hmm. the fleshiness of it is almost the sense that the surface could move. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's, there's something mm -hmm. happening there that is, it's, it's, we are reacting to the color and the forms, mm -hmm. the way that those things interact, and then the surface itself, which is so densely built and worked, it suggests yes. something very palpable to us. Also the sense that you can push into flesh, mm -hmm. and then it will kind of, you push in and then it kind of uh, swells around the yeah. pressure, right? And the types of transparencies that flesh gives us, right? right. Yeah. So I think the sort of idiosyncrasies that exist across the works, and I think about how we've got out here um, Sky tonight. Um, her work is very idiosyncratic and very specific, but I also really love the way in which she's able to um, almost present us with these parts of speech almost. It's like these little chunks of speech Visual speech, things that we know what they are. The light switch mm -hmm. is on, right? The eggplant is in that shape, and it's sort of establishing this weird dynamic where the, the meaning is the abstraction in a sense. The, the, the associations are the abstraction. We've got time, we've got uh, female reproductive organs, we've got the eggplants, which are a reference to male reproduction. We've got the carbonate hibernation box. The idea is, is this is she saying, this is cold, it's in the box? Um, and that's also a euphemistic term for the box, right? So like, she's doing these kinds of things which I think are both funny and kind of one-liners piled on top of each other. So the, the references that we get are maybe less about reading color and form and more about reading like, like small chunks of identification, moments of identification. Little signs. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Well, I mean, that's another thing when we talk about um, depiction, and uh, these are words that get used differently, right? They get, yeah. So you get depiction and representation, but then when you start talking about something representing something else, you talk about signs and symbols. Right. And, um, and so, you say Magnum's work, um, they are, there are um, choices that seem to um, suggest metaphorically grass or, mm -hmm. or a uh, kind of land topography, but in this case, we have uh, choices that are, that we know what they are, but they're not depicted in illusionistic space, except that there's even a kind of symbol for illusion, like this, mm -hmm. the corner of a room, <laughs> this, the corner of a box, right? Yeah. Um, even though it's not drawn in perspective and so on, right. and it's transparent. Um, and then we've got things like the clock, the eggplant, you know, the phone, the, what is that? Banana. I was going to call it a banana, but it, it looks kind of like a banana across between the banana and the <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, um, uh, there are these uh, moments that are uh, these that are stopping points visually. Mm -hmm. We stop and we look, but it also has a, a kind of structure to it that is rhythmic and abstract, and it pulls us through the whole and across it in a way that isn't traveling through a depicted space, like those Dutch still lives, mm -hmm. where you might start at the edge of the table and your eyes might stop at the lemon peel as it pokes over the edge, mm -hmm. and then you travel across and over to the plums, or you know, whatever. And, and there's a fly. Right, there always is a fly. <laughs> but the, the, the other thing that comes up here is the idea of the, of the tension between, say, what is um, iconographic and what is illusionistic. Like, I think that she's still giving us some kind of idea of illusionistic space. Mm -hmm. When you look over there at the Liz Powell pieces, and that's, to me, they're very iconographic. And they establish their own kind of centrality and symmetry, and yet it's, mm -hmm. it's a felt thing. She's not laying them out on a computer. She's not, she's not letting the symmetry tool on the mm -hmm. device do it for her, right? She's in there mm -hmm. and making every single layer by hand, building up that gouache. Right. You might want to get up close to these. These, they're very exquisite. Right? They're, and part of what they're about is how exquisitely they're made. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they have, they have to be, like the fact that they're small, they're like uh, a little larger than playing cards. Mm -hmm. um, 
that really matters. You know, yeah. you can you can imagine the labor involved, mm -hmm. and then you can also imagine that you hold their hand size, right? Yeah. Um, and, or they're like, uh, if you were looking at them, they're not really windows like paintings are, mm -hmm. but they sort of are because they exist in these slightly pink mats. Yeah, I, I love how you notice the, the difference between the, the value tone, I guess, of the frame versus the mat versus the backing paper versus yeah. the picture itself, yeah. the image itself. There's a lot of subtle color that's happened. I think that you mentioned it last time we were here, that movement from the strong purples and the yeah. intense colors through, then you've got the lighted, the backlighted right. digital thing. Right. You come around, this this wall is very sort of subtle and has these beautiful sort of peachy, pastel tones. Yeah, we got sort of the pink zone to the purple path, right. <laughs> all held against that, um, oh, I think that was a color man. That chartreuse. Chartreuse, yeah. thank you. <laughs> it's kind of punchy chartreuse. But that's, that's you know, on you, right? Because you're the one who is, yeah, you, know, I, you I, sequence. I made that choice. Yeah, and um, I may have like had a little input, but the sequencing of this is... Well, I, I, I think another thing that's sort of a subtle narrative in here is, is what what keeps us out and what makes us come in. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at, these to me appear to be out. They're, they're, you look at the front of them. Mm -hmm. There's not necessarily an illusion going in, right? Mm -hmm. And um, these are Aaron King's works. These are early works from maybe four or five years ago. But they really aren't about an illusion of death, even though they have, they have physical death. They have actual death. And they take up actual space, right? Um, she actually stretched these over over parts of the piano, is how they were initially, and using the piano as a loom, essentially. And she wove them. And she wove them. Right. So this again, if you come up close and sort of look around the side and under and across the surface, people can get a sense of how it's made. And also the different kinds of stitching and, and, right. and weaving that she's doing in there, right. the different types of materials, you know, this. In some sense, these, it's kind of cacophonous, but in another sense, it's a very subtle kind of, uh, I think of them almost as like a, a musical piece, a composition. Um, and so I think, you know, works like these, which appear to be about the surface and you look at them, but they have physical depth versus something like Jennifer Ann Waves piece over here, which is really, you know, it's all about that black hole, that black opening. And she talks a lot about just with the way that the the form sits there, we're, we almost are meant to go in. And in some sense, the, that that black is so matte and so dense and so flat that we almost don't even see the chartreuse. It's like we, we she wants us to pop into it. The title of this is the I've forgotten the title. It's about that. Yeah, it's um, I believe it's the black hole or the okay. black. Yeah. So there's a sense of it. And then you get this really interesting slight illusion like with that blue, mm -hmm. that sort of like purpley, intense blue, and you pop back. So there's a little suggestion of almost perspectival space on that. I, this, this piece, and also um, uh, certain others like Magalies, I, I saw them and in my mind, I was high above them, ethereal, mm. you know, and so, I did this funny thing where I just immediately saw this as a kind of pool, you know, and I, I really, I really imposed a subject on it. I mean, the green for me is just like it's it's hard for me to actually look at green in a painting and not immediately think about the references of landscape and you know uh, foliage and looking down. And so that you know that this is I, I can't unsee this. I, I just keep seeing it in those terms. Yeah. And so I always see this. As surrounding land, and this is the opening of a, mm -hmm. a reflecting pool of some kind. So that idea of the, the shape being the opening, mm -hmm. in a sense, is also iconographic, but it's related very much to Simon Tatum's work, which is right here right. behind the camera. Part of that, that surface yeah. is kind of reflective, so you may not be able to see it too well. But the idea, this one is called um, traveler or traveling. So almost as a suggestion in the abstraction of the mark making is the sense of a passage or a movement. So even though it's very dense and it's, it's ink on mylar and it's up close, there's still a sense of it projecting. 
or him, him suggesting the projection to space. So this piece, to my eye, uh, seems uh, very different from a lot of the other work. Um, and part of it is just my, my history of looking at art. I immediately thought about these uh, early Lester Johnson heads, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I see it as a kind of subject, like a, a head reference, you know, mm -hmm. like the, mm -hmm. the symmetry of it, the mm -hmm. division through here, it's an ear. You know, mm -hmm. just, that's how I, I end up reading it that way. Um, and so unlike, the, well, the other pieces seem to go back and forth between being very much object, like, uh, mm -hmm. like these two woven pieces over here are really sculptural things mm -hmm. that exist, yes. you know, dimensionally on the wall, but mm -hmm. they're objects. And then the other pieces are, are abstractions, but they tend to have a relationship to a, a kind of space, either mm -hmm. a still life space or a mm -hmm. landscape space. And this one feels very different. Yeah, for me it's the, the sense of that archetypal, the archetypal form, it's, it's not just in, you know, it is that, that over, you're seeing the head shape, but I'm also seeing the X. Yeah. And I'm seeing the projection yeah. of maybe like a roadway. Right. But the idea of the form being suggestive without being referential, right. that's, that's hard, that's, that's intense. Yeah. And in some sense, that's what uh, my friend Joel and I were trying to do in these two pieces. This is a collaboration between my friend Joel T. Dugan and I. And in some sense, what we were thinking of them is almost like uh, theoretical letters or theoretical numbers. Like the idea of uh, the concept of the phoneme, which is the, the sound yeah. chunks that come together to make words, yeah. parts of sounds that come together to make words. Imagining what would it, what would it be to have additional ones or other ones. But yeah. can you talk about because you actually sent these back and forth through the, yeah, through yeah. the mail, right? Yeah, Joel and I, since 2013, have been sending small works like this back and forth. And that that uh, sort of mail collaboration, mm -hmm. flopping them back and forth, and kind of leaving it up to the other person. And they'll often take years. I mean, these probably were built with a group of 15 or 20 others over the course of, you know, maybe, maybe three or four passages between where we live over the course of maybe three or four years. Um, I actually just got a pack of paintings from him the other day, so mm -hmm. I'm ready to tackle a few more. What kind of paint? Um, so these are primarily um, oil paint, but there's also, like I'm also drawing back in with Sharpies and alcohol mm -hmm. markers and different things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm asking because of course oil paint takes longer to dry, yeah. and then if you're putting it in the mail, it becomes a long-lived thing on that. Like it has, you have to live with it for a while while it dries yeah. on the right. stick in the mail. Right. Um, and then these do this, this, like, they, um, they do this funny thing where this, this exists almost like a little character or mm -hmm. figure, but then it also exists as an opening. Yes. It, so it, it almost feels like it's kind of, rolling across the bottom here and, and moving this way out. <laughs> it's, it's, almost, it's almost cellular too, yeah. you know, like there's stuff in here and then there's stuff out there. But this also, I think, I, I was the one who had the final say on this one. And this one actually, every once in a while I feel like I do little, little homages to people and I think this is a little homage to Jim Lutz. Uh -huh. Maybe, yeah. you know, the, the heads that he, he has yeah. done off and the, and the transparencies yeah. that he gets. Um, also these big, like having a big bulbous form in the center. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, th these two are really much about the pedimente and allowing elements from Joel's hand and elements from my hand mm -hmm. to superimpose and live together and separate and mm -hmm. recover or deny. And so we're playing a lot with um, almost like wrestling with each other um, mm -hmm. to come to a conclusion that neither of us could have imagined mm -hmm. and yet becomes its own logic through the making. And that's a, that's a super important yeah. aspect of it. So with um, with the reference to Jim Lutz, I um, should make a, a point that the, this, this show, um, the artists um, come from different parts of the country, and in some cases maybe originally different parts of the world, but um, there is this underlying connection to Chicago that many of them have. And so um, Matt actually studied at the Art Institute of Chicago. Jim Lutz lives in Riverside, um, mm -hmm. but is also, um, Professor 
at the School of the Art Institute, Art Institute of Chicago and a you know, very, very respected painter here. Um, Sky studied with Matt, mm -hmm. um, but at also the went to, but then, yeah, you, at Mizzou, but then went to graduate school here, yeah. right? Um, and, um, and I'm forgetting his name. Simon Tatum. Simon also. Um, Study. Right, but and did he also go to school here? No, he's at Kent State. Kent State, he's okay. Graduate, okay. He's a graduate at Kent right. State right now. Natalie, um, she's currently in Texas, but she um, doing a, a residency at Marfa, but um, she's been in Chicago for a long time. She came from Montreal and uh, then was in New York and then came to graduate school at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Now she teaches there, right? Um, uh, uh, Sharon, I believe, is just based in New York. I mean, I've seen her work in New York, and I, I know of her and through she her teaches up in Connecticut. So. I know of her through her paintings, but also she um, is the originator, founder, editor, writer for um, two, three two, two coats of paint. paint. <laughs> we get three coats, but it's two coats of paint. The two coats of paint block. Right, right. Um, and and so um, there are other artists in here that I'm not familiar with that that Matt is connected to, but but there's also this. Uh, Chicago um, connection that's been folded into this iteration of the show, which makes a lot of sense, and so it makes sense to have it here. Yeah, so I've really tried to build something that's both unified and where each piece can kind of push, put pressure on the other pieces. You see connections, you see unifications, you see separations mm -hmm. as you move through, and that's probably what I'm hoping to try to do with it. Um, some artists have a few pieces, some artists have one, yeah. You have a little an ebb and flow that happens with the whole thing, and I hope that that comes across as people move through. Yeah, it's a beautiful show. Thank you very much for letting me yeah. do it. It's it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs>